Thank you, Ben. Good evening. Greetings to everyone in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I hope before you enter, you took two extra pieces of paper other than the prayer weekly. One of them is coloured. That is the map that is in my Bible. Okay, so please make sure you know the source, where it came from. It is taken from my Bible, which is Holman King James Study Bible. Okay? And the other chart was done by me, taken from Genesis 11, as you can see from the heading. We shall glance at it for tonight because Peleg is mentioned. And the Bible said that during Peleg's time, that's when the divided or the division occurred. Okay, so please make sure you have these two extra pieces of paper. Let's look to God in prayer. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee once again, Lord, for this time where we can come together in peace, in tranquility, and in health, in strength, and by Thy providence to come and study Thy Holy Word. We pray, Father, for Thy Holy Spirit to help us and grant to us attentive ears and receptive hearts. In Jesus' name we give thanks and pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn number six. Hymn number six, How Great Thou Art. <clears throat> o Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think, that God his Son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation,
salvation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, how great Thou art, there is no way any one of us could ever fully comprehend Thy greatness. For Thou art indeed the creator of heaven and earth, the God who is always in absolute control of everything that happens in heaven and on this earth. Help us therefore, o Lord, as Thy blood-bought children, to learn to be still and to know that Thou art God, the great God, Most High, the Almighty, so that whatever lot in life, whatever trials or adversities and difficulties that we may be experiencing right now, help us to know that none of these things can happen to us without Thy sovereign will and permission. And when You permit them, O Lord, to come our way, we know that it will turn out for our spiritual good and well-being Teach us, therefore, to draw closer to Thee in times of adversities than at any time in our life. Cleanse us and wash us, O God, of all our sins by the precious blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, as we commit to night study of Thy Word and prayer meeting unto Your loving hand. We pray, Father, for Thy Holy Spirit to be our teacher once again tonight, helping us to behold wonderful truths out of Thy holy and precious Word of life. For we ask all these things with thanksgiving and for thy glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Tonight we shall look at Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, and we shall study the entire chapter, which means we have to read all the 32 verses. And since we believe every jot and tittle of God's word is inspired, even though it contains a lot of names, it doesn't mean that it is not important. We're going to highlight certain individuals and certain names that we will and should be very familiar with. And there, we shall see and understand the main topic, replenishing the earth. All right, that had been God's command to Adam and Eve after they fell into sin. And that was God's command to Noah and his family after the end of the flood, to replenish the earth. The earth is now very, very vacant. Everyone was in one location. And the Lord said, you have to disperse. And so we are going to study that. So please follow as I read to you Genesis chapter 10. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Yavan, and Tubal, and Meshach and Tiras, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rephah, and Togamah, and the sons of Yavan, Elisha, and Tashish, Kittim, and Dodanim. And these were the owls of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mitzraim, and Phut, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Siba, and Havilah, and Sapla, and Ra'amah, and Saptakah, and the sons of Ra'amah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalneh, in the land of Shina. And out of that land went forth Ashuru, and builded Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth, and Kala. And Resen 
between Nineveh and Kalah, the same is a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lechabim and Nachtuhim and Pathusim and Kashluhim, out of whom came the Philistine and Kaftorim and Canaan or Canaan begat Sidon and first, his firstborn and Heth and the Jebusite and the Amorite and the Girgashite and the Hivite and the Archite and the Sinite and the Arvadite and the Zemarite and the Hamatite and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon as thou comest to Gera unto Gaza as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Atma and Zeboim even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries and in their nations. Unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. So of the three, Shem, Ham and Japheth, Japheth was the oldest. Even to him were children born, the children of Shem, Elam and Ashur and Arphasad and Lud and Aram. And the children of Aram, Uts and Hul, and Gether and Mash, and Arphasad begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Yoktan. And Yoktan begat Almodad, and Shelef, and Hazar Mavet, and Yerah, and Hadoram, and Uzal, and Dikla and Obal, and Abiael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Yohab, all these were the sons of Yoktan. And their dwelling was from Misha, as thou goest unto Shifa, a mount of the east. And these are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. God bless us in the public reading of his most holy and sacred word. Why did God have to disperse the people? We know that when we arrived in the new Jerusalem, in the new heaven and new earth, there'll be no more dispersion. We'll all be one, one big, happy, gigantic family, billions of men and women, all redeemed and washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice I did not say children, huh? Because I believe children all, when they arrived in the New Jerusalem, they will not be children. They will all be adults. At what age will all be? At rapture, only the Lord knows. Commentators assume that since Jesus was raptured at the age of 33, that will be the common age of all of us when we arrived in heaven. So if you were called home to glory at the age of 800 or 90, you will revert back to 33. That's what some commentators assume when they talk about the resurrection. What age will we be when we stand before God in eternity? But there's nothing wrong with staying together. We all love to stay together, right? There is some kind of bond and fellowship just like families, when our children marry and they leave home, there is a happiness as well as a sadness. And then we know that from this day onwards, our family that had always been together since the children were born will no longer be together. And it is the right thing to do because they have to leave home and start their own families. And yet this togetherness is a good thing if we all have only one goal in mind. And that is the mind of Christ. That's the only way. And so when all of us have the mind of Christ, like in heaven, it's a good thing to remain together and no need to disperse. However, when it is the sinful nature that is in man, and when men refuse to disperse, and when they assemble together, it will be a gigantic disaster. As you can see, from verse 1 to verse 5, as we read these 32 verses, I'm sure you know 
The whole earth was of one language and of one speech at this point in time. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina and they dwelt there. And then that's how the Bible stopped. And then from verse 3 onwards, the Bible said, they said one to another, go to, sorry, I beg your pardon, I've been reading verse 11, uh, chapter 11, chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. All right, that was it. And then God suddenly straight away entered into the dispersion, beginning with Japheth, followed by Canaan or Ham, I beg your pardon, Ham, and then uh, devoted uh, the most number of verses for Ham, and then uh, from verse 21, it will be Shem. And the common uh, phrase that you see would be verse 5, verse 20, and verse 31. Everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Where did they get all the different languages from? They only had one language. Chapter 11, verse 1, will explain how they had different languages. So chapter 10 actually should come after chapter 11, verse 1 to verse 9. And then when you look at verse 10 of Genesis 11, you realize that God stopped in chapter 10 and did not elaborate on Pelech in verse 25. He just simply mentioned Pelech, and then he described the descendants of Pelech's brother, Yoktan. And then after he concluded describing the children of Yoktan, which numbered 13 sons, the Lord just simply stopped and then summarized it in verse 31. Because God wanted to continue the lineage of Pelech in Genesis 11, because that would be the Messianic line. So the first thing we notice concerning this replenishing the earth is that the dispersion was a necessity. Okay, they have to disperse. The Bible says they were divided in their lands and that's where you have the colored chart for you. Okay, the green portion is hemp. The yellow portion is Shem. You notice the green portion stretch covered the promised land, which is called Canaan. And then the red portion is Japheth. Okay, because Cush is Ethiopia. And that's why they have the green portion, the top part of Africa. They were divided by lands and because of different languages, tongues. And then after that, they divided again according to families. And then from there, they became nations. So this was God's plan. And as long as they stayed together, it was not according to God's plan. And therefore, they must disperse and fill the world with people. They should not concentrate in one location, as you can see. Why in chapter 11? But the dispersion was good. Now we need to find out what was the time frame from the end of the flood to the time of the dispersion. Now I would like you to look at the table. From this table, you notice that when Peleg was born, Noah was 702 years old. Okay, all you need to do is to do a little bit of mathematics from Genesis 11. And you will come to the same conclusion. Now, God called Noah to begin building the ark when he was 500 years old. And then he took 100 years to complete, and then the flood came. And the flood lasted one year. And so the flood ended when he was 601 years old, correct? And so if he was 702 years old when Peleg was born, there would be a span of 101 years from the time of the end of the flood to the time of Peleg's birth. Now, the Bible did not say at what age Peleg was when the earth divided in verse 25. The Bible simply says 
during his days was the earth divided. All right, how long did Peleg live? 239 years. So during this span of time, whatever the age Peleg was, we, we were not told. But during his lifetime, the earth divided. Noah was still very much alive. You notice that Noah lived all the way right up to the birth of Terah. When Terah, the father of Abram, was born, he was only 823. So he lived through the entire period, which means he was very much alive to witness the dispersion. He witnessed what happened in Genesis 11. Now, Genesis 11 did not tell us who was the leader, but Genesis 10 revealed to us who the leader was, Nimrod. And so the dispersion was part of God's plan because God wanted nations. And in all these nations that will be spread throughout the world till today, right up to the first coming of Christ and into the second coming of Christ, there will be all these nations. The Messianic line will have to be protected always. If they stay in one place with a sinful nature in man still very much just as evil and wicked as it was before the flood, Jesus mentioned that, God, or God mentioned that in the scripture, that man's heart was not changed after the flood. It was still very evil and wicked, just as depraved as before the flood. So this new beginning, even though it may have started with eight believers who came out of the ark, but very soon when they started to have children, after more than a hundred years, they gathered together. How many there were, we are not told. Thousands, tens of thousands, because look at their ages. Even though Moses said three score years and ten, and by reason of strength, add another ten more years. But at that point of time, very soon after the end of the flood, even though the ages have declined from eight, nine hundred on an average, is now on an average about 400, 200, and then 100 plus, just under 200. Nahor was the youngest, 148. Abraham, 175 when he died. And so this man, Nimrod, he was the cause of the separation. The Bible tells us in chapter 10, verse 6, the descendants of Ham. Cush, of course, is Ethiopia. Then the Bible tells us, Cush begat Nimrod, verse 8. And he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, mighty is not with reference to him being a hunter of animals, because the whole chapter is about human beings. So he would be a mighty hunter, the Bible said, right? Of what? Animals or men? Men. Because the whole context is about people how he will assemble the people by force, in other words. If you do not do what I say, you're going to get it from me. Either he will beat you, or he might even kill you. He will definitely threaten you. That's Nimrod, a mighty hunter. How do we know that he would be the character in Genesis 11? Because the Bible said he was the one, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. That's Babel. And the term of Babel came about in Genesis 11, the confusion of tongue. So Nimrod was the main culprit. And we're going to talk more about him, God willing, next Tuesday evening when we focus on Genesis 11, verse 1 to verse 9. But for tonight, we'll just simply mention his name and how God characterized him. Mighty one in the earth, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Mentioned twice for emphasis. He is, or was, very much like the Antichrist. Or the Antichrist would be very much like him. Force will always be the way to rule and to conquer out there in the world. That's the only way. 
Sinful men controlling other sinful men. There is no other alternative but by force. We have seen this in human history, repeated over and over and over again till today. And you look at our present state of our 21st century world. It's the same. The only way that other men can control men is by force. And so people in power, heads of state and government with very, very vast military might, they will have the largest and the biggest control. This is our history. We call them, or they call themselves, empires. In the Bible, the Bible did speak of empires. The Babylonian, the Medo Persians, the Grecian Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And then you have the British Empire later on. And then you have so many more empires after the Roman Empire. And then further down after or before, the Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, before the Assyrian Empire, this is only one part of the world, the central portion that concerns us because it's recorded in Scripture. All the other portions, other nations in other continents, same thing happened. That's the only way man will rule fellow men. So much so that when the disciples were told by the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to leave you. And what did they do? Who's going to replace you as head? And so Jesus, instead of replying with words, he stooped down and washed their feet. You want to be a leader to look after my flock? This is what you need to do. Only the lords out there in the Gentile world, they will lord over their people because that's the only way. Sinful men are wielding power. The only way to control fellow sinful men is by force, threats, persecution, or bribe. No other way. That's why they have to disperse. They cannot remain. And when they remain together, you can understand Nimrod, one man threatening the people, the descendants of Noah, and Noah was still alive, probably could not do anything. What could he do? How old was he when Nimrod was born? Well, we are not told. But it's after Cush. He was still alive when Peleg was there, right? So he would be 700 years old when this incident took place, assuming that it would be soon after Peleg's birth, if it's into the middle of Peleg's age of 239, at another 100, there'll be 200 over years after the flood, and Noah was still very much alive. And he could not do anything. The rest, you can see, who would still be alive by this table when... Uh, the dispersion occurred. In the table I give to you, all the ages, basically it covers the whole book of Genesis in terms of the ages. Okay? The writings at the bottom below the table. It covers all of them, right up to the death of Joseph. And then I put in all my notes and commentary. Who was still alive when Isaac was born, when Isaac had his twin boys, Esau and Jacob, and then what happened to Joseph when he was sold by the brothers? Who was still alive? All these, they are there. You can do it yourself if you want to do some mathematics. I put down the text for you as well, where all the ages and the names are all taken from, so that you can do your own calculation if you want to do so, to check whether I did it accurately if you want to. But the dispersion was needful. If one man controlled how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of souls, and all of them wicked except for those who are born again and the messianic line will be in jeopardy. One language, one man, mighty hunter of men, before the Lord. Can you imagine? Basically, a world leader concentrated in one tiny little part of this earth. One world ruler. That's Nimrod. The first one world ruler after the flood. Scary, isn't it? That's why God himself had to directly intervene. No other way. If God did not intervene like what he did before the flood, 
200 over years after the flood, God's plan of salvation could have been thwarted because the Messianic line would be part of this gathering. But the moment God separated them, you realize that the Messianic line will now also be separated in the yellow portion, safe from all of them because distance will keep the Messianic line safe. They cannot see each other. They cannot communicate with each other. They cannot hurt or harm each other. And that's why separation sometimes is the better option when people cannot get along. Just like Abraham and Lot, they could not get along. And the agreement was a mutual separation so that if you're in trouble, you come and help me. If I'm in trouble, I come and help you. And so on and so forth, right? So they have this agreement, which was exactly what happened. When Lot and his family were captured during this battle between the northern uh, kingdoms and the southern kingdoms where he lived in Sodom, Abraham was told and Abraham brought his 613 men and other men with him to help and save Lot and his family and all the other people as well. So separation. But in this case, they cannot remain. Dispersion was necessary. God had to force it so that the world will now be filled with people but at the same time to protect the Messianic line. Verse 21 to verse 32. But before that, just a little glimpse of verse 11. Notice Ashur, Nineveh, that is Assyria, the Ninevites. And then you look at verse 14, you have the Philistines also mentioned, all from the lineage of Ham. And then verse 15, our focus, Canaan or Canaan, beget Sidon, so Sidon also from the Philistines. That's the city, and Jebusite, where Jerusalem was, Amorite, Gergashite, Hivite, Archite, Sinite, some of them are gone by the time of Moses and Joshua, when Joshua conquered Canaan. But that's part of Ham. And so, in the map, there is a box where you highlighted, where the artist highlighted all the ites that are there, just for easy reference. Chapter 10, verse 21. And unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. This would be the Messianic line, as Genesis 11, verse 10 onwards will indicate. And this was the line that God had to protect at all costs, no matter what. And as long as this lineage continued to coexist with the lineages of the other two sons of Noah, Ham and Japheth, especially from the lineage of Ham with Nimrod as the world leader, as it were, it would be a problem. And God had to protect the Messianic line at all costs. The devil will never stop see and understand the dispersion from a spiritual perspective. The world that we are living in as is all began with this incident, the dispersion. And if they were not forced to disperse, we can't even imagine what it was like in those days with a one world ruler, one language, and all assembled in one location. That's why the Bible tells us that when the second world ruler, and this time God will give him permission to succeed, the Antichrist, his kingdom is known as the iron and the clay, according to the book of Daniel. Unlike the iron of the Roman Empire, which is one material, Caesar had total absolute power over the vast Roman Empire. But iron and clay, they do not mix, which means the power of the Antichrist is global, but it will not have the cohesion of the Roman Empire where Caesar literally controlled the whole Roman Empire. That means there will be other nations that will resist him as Revelation revealed to us. And they will resist the Antichrist and they will be put down by the Antichrist. 
So the Antichrist will come from the Roman Empire, and that means it will be Europe. And we know based upon today's big boys, big nations, who are the likely nations that will not accept the one world ruler. It's not going to be all these tiny little nations like Singapore. We are just nothing, nobodies. But it will be the big ones. The big ones that have hundreds of millions of people, which today's world call them superpowers. They are the ones who will make life difficult for the Antichrist when he rises to power pretty soon. But of course, before that, there will be the rapture. We will all be caught up. And then his identity will be revealed and that will be the beginning of the final seven years of this world's existence before the Lord returns to destroy it as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But in the meantime, when the first attempt of a world ruler happened in the time of Peleg, in the time of Nimrod, God said, I have to stop it. It's not time yet. Not my time. I control. I can stop it and I can permit it. It's up to God. How great thou art. That's why that hymn was chosen tonight. Controlling the whole world. Can you imagine that? Because this is basically what it happened. God controlled the people of the world at that time, every single being, they congregated in one place and because they congregated in one place, nothing wrong with congregation in one place, right? We know that. If everyone has the same mind and the same heart that is characterized by goodness, kindness, holiness, fine. But when it is full of sin and evil and wickedness and they are going to make decisions that are going to be against God's word and against God's plan and God's will, God had to intervene and stop it. And it will be literally the whole world as we know it, every single human being. Parallel it today, even though the number may be greater, seven, eight billion, if the Lord were to return right now. You think God cannot control? He demonstrated his power by destroying the world with water. He now demonstrates his power in controlling and stopping the first ecumenical movement led by this evil, mighty hunter of man called Nimrod. God stop it. And therefore God says, not time yet. I want you to replenish and fill the world and divide it according to nations. And that's how my only begotten son will come one day, born of the nation of Israel. God says you must replenish the earth. If they refuse, and they did, God forced it. That's how great God is. That's how the Messianic line was protected and preserved by God, by dispersion. They have to be separated. God is always in total, absolute control of this world. When you read the news and you listen to the radio, you hear of all these dialogue and all these powerful men assembled together, bartering, making all kinds of deals trying to bring peace in Ukraine and in the Middle East and in any other country, very, very worried about those hot spots. Do not ever take God out of the equation when you hear all these things. Do not take the doctrine of the sovereignty of God in particular out of your equation on how you should feel and react and respond when you hear all these things, because you and I are helpless, because these are the people in great power like Nimrod, mighty hunter of men before the Lord. The key is before the Lord. Don't forget that. They'll always be before the Lord. 
And He is our Lord. He is our Heavenly Father. He is our Lord Jesus Christ. It's always before them. Before us, it doesn't matter. We are helpless. They can do everything in secret in all these closed doors. They can hide themselves in the deepest mountain as if no one would know, no one would hear. But every time, it will always be before the Lord, our Heavenly Father, whom we call Abba. Don't forget that. And that will straight away give you peace in your heart. They can talk all they want, they can make all the decisions they want, but ultimately, whatever the decision that they arrived at, it's controlled by our Heavenly Father, not them. Or they might think that they control it. They might think that they are the ones who have the final word and they have the power to do it. But because it is always before the Lord, our Lord, that's why you should always be very at peace that whatever decision they make, and even when the things may appear to be out of hand, and if the horrible war in Ukraine and Russia spread into other countries in Europe, and what happened in the millions may also expand and spread if man cannot prevent it, please always know, it is not man, it is your Heavenly Father. If you want it to stop immediately, He could. If you want it to continue or enlarged, He's in control. But whatever it is, know that it will culminate in the coming and appearance of the Antichrist. Why would countries like Singapore surrender their sovereignty? You ask yourself a simple question, common logic. Why would a country surrender their sovereignty, their currency, their pride to one man? There must be something that is so important that if we do not surrender our sovereignty, we might as well don't exist, right? What's the point of holding on to our currency and our sovereignty and we all perish, correct? So there must be something that is so devastating to so many of these nations that they are prepared to surrender everything, something that is so enticing, that is so good, a longing for peace. Right now, they are longing for it, but they don't get it. The longing for peace and the longing for prosperity because the economy of the world is going haywire. And these are very, very good reasons for countries like Singapore, the smaller ones that are not going to make a big impact. We are not superpowers. They will be very happy to just simply sit there and raise their hand and agree with everyone else. Let's vote and make him the one world ruler. And they're going to decide for us. Once you and I elect our leader, they're not going to come back and have another referendum and say and ask whether you and I are going to accept it. They're going to decide on our behalf. And once they decide it, that's it. But the Lord says before they make that decision to reveal the identity of the Antichrist, I will take all my children home, God says. And so you watch. They're going to talk, listen to the radio. They can talk all they want. But the moment a decision is made, every time a decision is made, it's closer to the revelation of the identity of the Antichrist. This chapter tonight reminds us of how great God is. He literally controls the world. And He has never stopped controlling the world. He controlled it then and he is still controlling it now. Every nation that rises to power and they fall, another comes after it and then another one comes and then another one fall, another one comes. He has really revealed that to us in Daniel. Liberals and modernists could not accept Daniel as prophecies because of the accuracy in which God revealed that after the Assyrians, there'll be the Babylonians, after the Babylonians, there'll be the Middle Persians, after the Middle Persians, there'll be the Grecian, after the Grecian, there'll be the Romans. The specificity of the detail of the prophecies, so much so that even unbelievers, where liberals and modernists who call themselves Christians, when they read it, they understand that this has to refer to all the succession of the nations that from our perspective is the past. 
this portion has to be written after the fact. There is no way that it could have been written as prophecy because they don't believe that the Bible is God's word. It's the book of man. God demonstrated this. So every nation that come and go, rise and shine under the noonday sun as what we call powerful nation and today because of the atomic weaponry, superpowers, nothing to God. Their might and their power are just like the power and might of end. When you look down at this end, that's how God looked at us, even more minute. Nothing. So do not fret or worry. Do not put your hope and your heart in anything that is of this world, please. If you do, you're going to fret, you're going to worry. You want to protect your bank account, your money, and your property. You are going to behave like an unbeliever. This world is not your home. The least important thing in every believer's life are his material things. All things spiritual are eternal. All things material are temporal. Bear that in mind. Don't ever forget. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where is your treasure? Where is your heart? They are one and the same. It should be the souls of men, women, and children, your relationship with your Heavenly Father, and your relationship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. These must be precious to you. Protect them. Cherish them. Look after them. Do whatever it takes to hold on to them. So as far as the material things are concerned, use them wisely for your spiritual well-being. That's our responsibility so that we can be faithful in the least. And God says, when you do that, I know I can trust you to be faithful in the much. There'll be the spiritual things, the souls of men, women, and children. Handle the material responsibilities well. And do not worry about all these economies and all these voices of man. Don't let it affect your heart and your mind. I know some of you are very, very good in economics. And all the more, you should take a step back and look through them and evaluate all your economic mindset through the glasses of the Scripture so that you will never forget how great our God is. Let us pray. Our merciful, loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee, Lord, that this world is not our home even though You have created it for us. But because it is full of sin, it has been so stained by the evil of men and the evil one. Help us, O Lord, as Thy blood bought children to remember that we are strangers and sojourners on our way to heaven. Teach us, therefore, to be mindful of our time on earth and to cherish every moment of every day and to live day by day as you have taught us to do, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto us. May this be our heart's desire and motivation so that when we live in this world for Christ Jesus, lift up our heart and our inner soul above all the voices and the fears and the threats of men, but to cling on to thee in peace, in tranquility, knowing that thou art in total, absolute control and nothing can happen on this earth without your permission and not one hair on the head of all your children would fall without thy knowing and thy permission as well. Help us, therefore, always to be still and to know that thou art God in our lives. Help us, therefore, to look forward to the return of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, but may we be busy in the business of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so that all of us may be found faithful and none of us will be found wanting. Forgive us, Lord, of all our sins. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. God bless. Let us break off into our groups for prayer.